Hello everybody, so today we are going to be looking at what affects the performance of the CPU. So first of all we need to understand what is the CPU. So CPU stands for Central Processing Unit and that's a common mistake that people make that because people often think that the C stands for computer but we know that it doesn't, it stands for central. And they, they can ask that on your exam. They might sometimes get you to fill in the gaps and the blanks, things like that. And uh, you don't want to fill in one of those wrong because it's a very easy mark that you don't want to lose. Okay, so in terms of what the CPU actually does, well, it, ha it actually does billions of what we call the fetch, decode, execute cycle. And we're going to go into more detail about that in just a moment. Now, in terms of where these instructions come from, they can come from input devices like your mouse or your keyboard, for example, or it could be program instructions. So the, the, the open programs that you've currently got running. But how do the CPU and RAM work together? Now, I've put in brackets there main memory because RAM is main memory and you can use those terms interchangeably in your exam. It doesn't matter. You, you wouldn't lose the mark for using RAM rather than main memory and vice versa. So the CPU will fetch the instructions from RAM. That's the proper word for it because that's the F and the FDE cycle. It will then bring that instruction back to the CPU the CPU will then decode it, which is the, obviously the D in FDA. Once it knows what the instruction is, it will then execute that instruction. And that doesn't mean to execute it, not that kind of execution, to carry out that instruction. Okay, and that is the FDE cycle, which it will just keep on repeating billions of times in one second. Now, when it comes to the performance of the CPU and how well it carries out those FDE cycles every second. The easy way to remember it are the three C's. And the first one is the clock speed, which we're going to talk about in a moment. Next one is cause. And finally, it's the cache. So your clock speed is measured in what we call hertz. But common up-to-date CPUs, you won't often see just hertz. You, you're going to be looking at something like gigahertz. So a typical clock speed would be something like this, 3.5 gigahertz. Okay, so the G being the giga, but we've still got hertz in there. Now, what that actually means is 3.5 billion instructions per second. Per second is actually really important, okay? So the higher that clock speed, if that was a higher number, you would be able to carry out more FTE cycles per second. Okay, the next thing that affects the performance are the cores. So a CPU can have multiple cores, and if you were explaining uh, why that might affect the performance, you could say that each core works independently. So let's have a look at some examples combining what we know about clock speed now and the cores. So here, here's an example of a CPU, 3.2 gigahertz dual core, okay? So when we see the word dual, it means it's got two cores, okay? So we've got 3.2 gigahertz, which we know is 3.2 billion, but then because it's dual core, it can do up to two times that amount. So 3.2 times by two or multiplied by two will give you 6.4 billion instructions per second. Let's have a look at one more example. So here's 3.5 gigahertz quad core. So we're going to do 3.5 multiplied by four this time. And you can think of quad being like a quad bike with four wheels. It's an easy way to remember it. So 3.5 times by 4 will give you 14 billion instructions per second. And the final thing that will affect the performance of the CPU is the cache. So cache holds frequently used instructions and it's located on the CPU. It has much faster access to cache than main memory.
too much cash could be detrimental to the overall performance. So some cache memory is good because it does you do have faster access to cache than main memory and that will speed up the performance of the CPU. So just to finish this session, I wanted to just put some example questions that you can have a little practice of. So it's probably a good idea if you want to pause the video now. The best way to revise with these kind of questions is try and not rewind the video. Um, try and not look back in any notes inside your book that you may have been making as you were going. I want you to try these questions and then check your answers. And if you've made any mistakes, don't worry about it. You can just try it again. And that's the whole point. When you, you keep on trying and answering those questions, that's how you will embed that knowledge. Hey. So today we are going to be having a look at what is an embedded system. Before we have a look at what is an embedded system, we do need to understand what is a computer first. So a computer is any programmable machine or electronic device which takes in data, processes it, and then outputs the results. So this is that model, the input process output model that we've probably heard of before. Importantly as well, computers are general purpose. Now when we say general purpose, it means that you can have multiple programs installed onto the computer and you can access them, you can use the computers for different reasons. So that is what is meant by general purpose. An embedded system is similar to a computer, however it's kind of the opposite. So if you were going to answer a question about what is an embedded system, you could quite simply say it is a system that is built into a larger machine. That's accepted on the mark scheme. And not as a separate answer, but something you can add on to your answer. You can say that they are built for one purpose. And a good thing about an embedded system is once it's been made, it doesn't need updating for whichever machine that it's built into. So all of the components of the embedded system are usually built into a single circuit board. And we're going to look at a few examples now. So the first example is a washing machine. And this is top of the list on the mark scheme as well. So if you think of a washing machine, and if you were going to open it up, which I wouldn't recommend, you've got buttons on the front of your washing machine. And inside you've got a single circuit board that these buttons will interact with. And these buttons can do different things such as um, starting your wash, it could be to, to change the temperature, it could be to cancel the wash, and so on. And all of these will interact with that single circuit board that is being built into this larger machine. Other examples include a microwave or a microwave if you're Nigella Lawson. Got a toaster. Notice that all of these are kitchen appliances by the way. Apart from this, you, unless you use that in the kitchen, you've got a calculator, but there are loads more. So if you're trying to think of some examples in your exam, think kitchen. It's probably your easiest way to remember. Here are some example questions that you can practice. I would recommend pausing the video now and giving them a go. Don't forget, try and not look back at any notes that you've got in your book or try and not rewind the video. Give them a go first and then you can go back and see if you got them right. In this session, we're going to be looking at what are the main parts of the CPU. And a little bit later in the session, we're going to be looking at what's known as von Neumann architecture, which is less confusing than it sounds. So we need to understand that the CPU has three main parts. And these are the control unit, the arithmetic and logic unit, and finally the cache. So we're going to start by talking about the control unit. Now the control unit manages the actual FDE cycle, which we've talked about before. So it manages the, the fetching of the instruction itself. Once it's fetched it and brought it back, it will then decode that instruction and it will execute the instruction, which as we know are, are the three main steps that are repeated billions of times in one second in the FDE cycle. So if data needs to be moved around the CPU or maybe moved back into main memory, then the control unit is the part of the CPU which will actually do that. The next part of the CPU is the arithmetic and logic unit. If you remember what that one stands for, then you'll be able to remember what it does really because you've got the word in, in the title itself, the arithmetic part of it. So it does all of the calculations and it performs logic operations such as and, or, and not. Now we'll do a completely separate video on Boolean operators and what logic gates and circuits look like. Uh, but all you need to know for now is that the, the 
the arithmetic logic unit does all the calculations and it does perform the logic operations. There has been questions in the past where you had to fill in the blanks, you had to fill in what these letters stood for. So it is worth understanding that the ALU does stand for arithmetic logic unit in case you are asked to fill in the blanks. So once the ALU has performed a calculation, it then has another part in it, which you can see there called the accumulator. And the accumulator will actually store the results of the calculations themselves. And this is one of the registers of the CPU. And finally, we've got cache. Now we have mentioned cache in a previous video. Uh, and the main, the main definition that we understood last time was that it stores frequently used instructions. So when the FTE cycle is being carried out, the CPU will actually check cache to see if the data is there first. Now, if it's not in cache, then it'll go to RAM to fetch it, basically. Now, one thing that we didn't mention last time was that there are different levels of cache. So level one is the fastest. And because it's so fast, it does have the lowest amount of storage as well. And it kind of follows that pattern. So level two is not as fast, but then it can hold more data. And finally, we've got level three, again, even slower, but it can hold the most data out of the three levels of cache. But your main thing that you need to know from cache is that it stores frequently used instructions. So they're the three main parts of the CPU, but now we're gonna look at what's von Neumann architecture. Okay, so I've put together this diagram, which hopefully makes it nice and simple to understand. So in terms of what von Neumann architecture actually is, it's a system where the CPU runs programs that are stored in memory. So as we know, the FTE cycle gets carried out billions of times in one second. And that's where the CPU will fetch instructions that are in memory. Now, the other parts that you can see in this diagram are the registers, which will actually help this process take place. So the program counter keeps track of what instruction that it's up to and will just increase every FTE cycle that's carried out. And it will pass that number to the memory address register. So let's say it was at instruction number one, it will pass that number one to the memory address register. Now the CPU at that point knows that it needs to look in memory address register one, which is in RAM or main memory. So at that point, it will do the fetch part of this cycle where it travels down to RAM and it will fetch whatever's in memory address one and it will bring it back and it will store it in the memory data register. Now at that point, going back to what the control unit does, it will actually decode that instruction and find out what it is that needs to happen. So it might be that it needs to perform a calculation or it might be that it needs to move somewhere else in memory and the control unit will make that happen. That's the execution part of it. If it was a calculation, the ALU or the arithmetic logic unit will carry out that calculation and then temporarily store it in the accumulator. The process just carried out again. So the program counter is increased to two and it will then start that cycle again where it will then fetch whatever's in memory address register two and then it will bring it back to the MDR and the control unit will take care of it. It will decode that instruction and it will execute whatever needs to happen next. So it's a relatively difficult but short topic that people get a little bit confused on, but it's actually fairly simple when you think about what, what you need to know. And we've got some example questions for you to try out. So most of these are based on ones that we've had in the past. And try and not look back in your notes when you're answering these and pause the video and then you can go back and check and see if you've got them right. The repetition of this is what will make this topic much easier, especially when it comes to thinking of the different registers and what their purpose are in, in, with the CPU. Okay, and that's it for this session. I'll see you next time.